Hello everybody, welcome to Mental Health TV. We're really pleased to have you with us today. And today we're going to be talking about a really interesting topic and one I think that's it's got a real place for us to discuss in terms of mental health and mental health practice. We're going to be talking about advanced practice. So before we meet our fantastic guest panel, let's go to Vanessa so she can tell us how you can join in, how you can share your comments and we'd really like to hear from you. So Vanessa. Thank you, Nikki. Hi, everyone. Um, looking forward to joining us tonight for lots of conversation. Um, I hope you will join us with asking some questions and commenting along the way. You can join in one of two ways. You can either join in on Twitter by going to the hashtag MHTV and following the feed there. And I'll be monitoring that if you've got any questions. Or you can go over to Facebook Live onto the Unite MHNA Facebook page like the page and you should see the live stream there with a comments box below and I'll be checking that out as well. So any questions, just feed them in via Twitter or Facebook. Thanks. Over to you, Nikki. Fantastic. So let's, in no particular order of greatness, we'll uh, go around the panel. So we'll start with you, Colette. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yep. Hi there. My name is Colette Henderson and I'm a lecturer at the University of Dundee and the programme lead for the MSc Advanced Practice. Fantastic. Thanks. Paul? Yeah, thank you, Nikki. Thanks, Colette. Yeah, and my name's Paul Smith. Um, I'm a mental health nurse um, and a mental health lecturer at the University of Dundee, and I, I lead on one of the modules that's part of the advanced practice at, at Dundee. Fantastic. And last but not least, Elaine, hello. Hi. Hi, I'm Elaine Armstrong, and I am an advanced nurse practitioner in mental health. But I've recently joined the university as a mental health lecturer I've also just taken on an honorary contract, so I will be practicing um, as an AMP in mental health going forward. Fantastic. Congratulations. Thank you. So before we get going, for anyone who doesn't know, perhaps we should talk a little bit about what advanced practice is. So you might hear it referred to as AP or advanced practice. So maybe you can come to Colette. Could you tell us a little bit about what are we looking at with AP? Yeah, sure. So I think it might be helpful just to reflect back on where it's come from in order for people to have an understand, an understanding of where we are at the moment. So advanced practice developed in the States in the 1960s, um, really because of a shortage of medics. And it was the pediatric population that was um, the main area of focus to start with. Mm. It was Dr. Loretta Ford and Dr. Henry Silver who led the development of it. And Loretta Ford has now just celebrated her 102nd birthday <laughs> and is still going strong and still very astute when it comes to all things advanced practice. So 1980s, Barbara Stilwell imported the role from the US to the UK and worked with the RCN to develop the first undergraduate programmes. Mm. They were subsequently franchised out to universities of um, Swansea, Cumbria and London South Bank mm. and initially as they were undergraduate programmes they then advanced to becoming master's programmes and certainly nowadays the focus is on that master's level thinking. We've had um, other researchers, Professor Kim Manley um, first uh, researched the, the role and requirements and um, produced this framework, the four pillars of practice. So the pillars are um, clinical practice, education, research and facilitation of learning. Now, they're slightly different names across the UK, but effectively that's um, what advanced practice programmes will focus on uh, programmes within the four pillars incorporating the four pillars and always at master's level. There's a range of policy contexts across the UK. So in Scotland, we have the Transforming Rules programme. Papers two, seven and eight focus on um, advanced practice um, from an ANP perspective or clinical nurse specialist perspective uh, within England, it's a multi-professional framework that focuses on multi-professional, so it's not limited to nurses. Mm. Scotland is moving that way, but have started originally with nurses. Uh, Wales have the framework for advancing nursing, midwifery and allied health professionals, and that's a 2010 document that's under review mm. at the moment. Uh, mm. And Northern Ireland have advanced nursing practice framework an advanced AHP framework. So all of them effectively say very similar things, mm. that it's about a level of practice rather than a specific role. Um, so that's one of the key things I think to remember, it's about this level of practice. Mm. 
all of these documents are um, specific to the countries. And the only one really that's developed on a UK wide approach has been the RPS um, advanced core advanced practice, uh, core advanced pharmacist curriculum, which was developed in 2022. So that's been quite an interesting approach because it's been different to the rest of the UK who nations who've taken their own individual approaches to advanced practice development. So that's really quite welcome that we're, we do have that collaborative approach in terms of pharmacy advanced practice. And certainly more now we're moving to work across the four nations to work together um, and be much more collaborative. So it's good to have pharmacy leading the way um, with that development. Yeah. In terms of the programmes, the programmes are quite prescriptive, pardon the pun. Um, they do include um, areas such as advanced clinical assessment, clinical decision making, clinical reasoning, uh, prescribing. And that all aligns with the type of role that advanced practitioners tend to be in, which, as you'll hear from the discussion that I've just had there, Initially, it's been very clinically focused, but that's not to mean that it's not available or should be endorsed in the other pillars. So education mm -hmm. pillar, leadership pillar, etc., research pillar too. So mm -hmm. it is very much focused on the level of practice rather than specific role. But the, the focus has been clinical because of the requirements that we have in practice at the moment. Uh, we're now at the stage where the NMC, the Nurse and Midwifery Council, are keen to review regulation and see if we need to have additional regulation in place. And obviously, mm. if we've got that for nursing, then we need to consider the other professions development of the roles as well, you, because we really don't want to have that two tier approach. Mm. The challenge, of course, is how do you regulate a level of practice? So that's um, that's been quite a big discussion. Um, internationally, predominantly, it's a nurse role, but there are countries now that are starting to move to other professions, advancing their practice as well. Um, so it's beginning to expand and we do have some guidelines internationally. We have the International Council of Nurses guidelines yeah. for advancing nursing practice, which really align with our own movement forward in terms of what should be in programmes and about that level of practice as well. So yeah. the other thing key to pull out for you would be the fact that we're saying it's master's level practice. Mm -hmm. So we've kind of stopped short of saying master's there. So it's recognised yeah. in yeah. some countries internationally that it's aspirational to have a full master's. But within the UK as well, we still are sitting with that master's level practice rather than fully endorsing the full MSC. So that's that's maybe something of interest that people might want to pick up on and discuss. But um, I think maybe uh, useful to hand over to Paul now, who might continue Absolutely. the conversation. Yeah, if you could tell us a little bit more about how that sits within the mental health sphere, that would be helpful. Paul. Yeah, thanks, Nikki. Thanks, Colette. And um, I guess one of the things we were discussing before everyone um, came live was... Um, how mental health um, nursing seems to have been um, last to, to the races with this as such. And um, my kind of real interest in advanced practice happened when I started uh, working with, with Colette at the university and starting to meet advanced practitioners um, who were in the role. Um, and uh, I, I, almost a frustration um, when speaking to them about the kind of lack of clarity um, that each advanced practitioner seemed to have um, different job descriptions. Um, although in incredibly impressed at the different settings that advanced practitioners were, were working in, and, and, and currently across mm -hmm. the UK, we, we know we have advanced practitioners working in forensics, um, you know, with, with, with elderly, um, with, with children, um, you know, and, and rehabilitation and, and some of the substance misuse services. So there's lots of work going on in advanced practice just now um but i suppose if you think about well psychiatric nursing as it was called um uh, you know when it was thinking about in the kind of 60s and 70s it, it started to take off you know as i think as a profession um not long after deinstitutionalization um and um we had nurses um and, and the modsley was really instrumental 
it's starting to kind of thinking about um, helping with education with mental health nurses mm. to take on these psychotherapeutic roles. Mm. Um, but um, in, the, in the 90s, I suppose, when the UKCC, as it was then, they started talking about these recommended specialist uh, roles and we started talking about mm. nurse prescribing. But interestingly enough, um, you know, within the pilot projects, um, psychiatric nursing or interchange between psychiatric nursing and mental health nursing um, wasn't involved in that. And, and I think, you know, one of the reasons was that um, there was concerns about the, um, the, the, the kind of sheer scale of um, serious mental illness and the complexity of it. Um, but we started to see, you know, um, mental health nurses uh, becoming much more autonomous in their practice and um, community mental health was, was kicking off. Um, yeah. But again, our community mental health nurses were tending to be looking after and supporting people um, with the so-called non-psychotic -psychot illnesses. Um, and, you know, even within our, our discipline as such, we, we were having great debates about whether um, mental health nurses should be involved in, in prescribing, which, um, as, as, as many of you will be aware, is a, is a key part of advanced practice. But even some of our, um, you know, our, our, our kind of great professors, um, and I'm thinking back to um, people like Phil Barker and, and Kevin Gurney, mm -hmm. who were at opposing ends of the spectrum as to whether <laughs> um, mental health nurses should be prescribing or not. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it, it seems to have continued um, about, you know, the, the, this kind of lack of, of, of clarity. And, and even now, as we as we we move into this kind of domain of advanced practice, which really is exciting, yeah. I've met some wonderful, enthusiastic yeah. people. I'm going to we're going to speak to and talk with Elaine very very shortly, who's involved in it. Yeah. But um, we still don't seem to be getting to grips with where is the best place for advanced practitioners to be working. Yeah. Um, what interventions are working most effectively? Yeah. Um, we, we talk about advanced practice, we talk about evidence-based practice, um, and again, thinking about our, our mental health advanced practitioners, what, what, what research are they actually getting involved in? Because when we speak to many of them, most of them are doing clinical work. So Colette's talked about the four pillars, yeah. but um, within mental health nursing, we just seem to be focusing on a couple of those pillars. Mm. And um, I suppose that's a, that's a concern for me but um so you no know, some wonderful opportunities just now um colette had mentioned about uh you know earlier about the the ways that you know we're providing education but again different universities have different content of mental health within their advanced practice education um so that and sorry. not everywhere offers it, Paul. Sorry, you know, within yeah. Scotland, for example, there's two universities that offer advanced practice MSc programmes. So, it, it, whereas we have 10 within Scotland, so only two out of the 10 are offering advanced practice programmes. And, you know, I totally agree with what you're saying. I think some of the pillars are more um, mm. considered than other ones. Research is, we really fall down with that, and we need to be doing more research in order yeah. to be able to support. Yeah. Um, the development of the role and you know supporting people it is about maximizing the role isn't it and not um, about a hybrid role or a replacement mm -hmm. medic or anything like that it's about maximizing our potential really yeah. really keen to see that happening in mental health nursing and I think yeah. you're right Colette because I think you know um, given the, the, the way that mental health services are just now they're under huge pressure just now um, with this enormous complexity um, of um, mental health and physical health presentations that it does lend itself I think um, for work to be done within advanced practice by mental health nurses and so there are wonderful opportunities. And I think one of the things I was hoping to kind of capture to, um, tonight from maybe some of the, 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 the viewers was, you know, just, you know, what, what, what kind of work are people doing within advanced practice? What are they aware of? Yeah. Um, but, and I suppose the other thing to mention is that some universities do offer an advanced practice um, mental health specific yeah. pathway rather than just advanced practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, 
So, so two, two within Scotland out of the ten offer that specific pathway, yeah. But um, absolutely, you know, it'd be interesting to know what some of the barriers are to people undertaking research and being involved in it as well, because I think as, as educators, we can support some of those developments too. And we're certainly really keen to help people develop whether, you know, their scholarly activity or whether it's been involved in research. And, you know, there's lots of opportunities. Just a quick, before Elaine gets to speak, just a quick um push for the International Council of Nurses, Nurse Practitioner Advanced Practice Nurse Network Conference that's going to be in Aberdeen in September 2024 and really would love to see mental health represented uh, well there. So there will be more information about that, but we do have a link for the, um, the website as well. Thank you. Sorry, Elaine, on you go. <laughs> we will that be was... tweeting out these things as we go. And I think was... Elaine hasn't had a chance to speak yet. We'll come to Elaine, but we're getting that lots was... of that was already. that was Colette's way of telling me to shut up and let Elaine <laughs> talk. So <laughs> thank, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Nikki. Yeah, I was just going to talk a little bit about the training. I didn't uh, do it conventionally. I knew very early on I had a, a passion for clinical work and still do, hence going back to uh, practice at least one day a month. And so I did an advanced uh, practice master's through the University of Dundee in 2011, I think it was. Oh, gosh, that's ages ago. Um, and I finished that in 2014 with the view of applying for advanced practice posts. However, that um, master's actually didn't, I couldn't then apply for advanced practice posts. So I had to go back and do the clinical decision making assessment module. But during from 2014, and to 16 I'd actually done my prescribing as well so I, I, I went in a slightly different route from some of my colleagues who'll probably be listening in uh, and I only had to do the two modules the mental health module and the clinical decision making assessment module however my colleagues they did an 18 month program I think it's good for people to know exactly what to expect because I know there's people from Tayside coming back there's that they're going to be going through it next year this year Mm -hmm. So they, they did an 18 month uh, programme, which was they started with the clinical decision making. They then went on to do a research module and then the non-medical prescribing and then the mental health module. And then they, they were in trainee posts while they were doing that. So I was slightly different um, from them. So I had to apply for an advanced nurse practitioner role which was rolled out as community they went for it in, in my area and they were very good uh, we, we were seven sessions clinically and uh, my manager was excellent she did give us time for leadership for research and things like that now we all practice differently and I think that's one of the things that that, that, that Paul kind of touched on even in the the three community mental health teams within the area I worked in yeah we were all working slightly different so it was really what was priority one of one of the big priorities was a uh, waiting list there was a large waiting list for neurodevelopmental assessments etc yeah. so I was quite passionate about that so I, I took on a lead role in doing um, that within my area mm -hmm. and it, it was successful I think I did a presentation to the the mental health group on the four pillars in one project I, I called it so there's loads of opportunities yeah. I think it's a very privileged um, position to be in as an ad advanced nurse practitioner. We are in challenging times, but mm. I think if you're going in and you're meeting your patients and giving 110% to every single one of these patients, it, it's a, a massive privilege uh, and uh, well worth well worth uh, going through all the, the, the qualifications to, to get that role. But we do need to, Paul's right, we do need to raise our profile. We have sat back quite quietly. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if that is because of where we're situated and it being in its infancy locally, definitely. I know in Scotland, there's people been doing it for 13 years, but we're in different roles this time. That They've put us into different roles. So there's still work to be done, but it is a worthwhile course to do and a great place to be in practice. Well, that's really great to hear. Yeah. Let's um, come to Vanessa for the questions and then no doubt you will, will set us off in a different direction, I think. Vanessa. Yeah, no, I mean, my first question links, I think, to what we've just been talking about. And that's around how do we change the perception about advanced practice being about creating replacement doctors? So that's the first question. And the second question we've got is around, is there any move to um, creating specific 
specialisms within advanced practice. So the examples given are forensic mental health, psychotherapeutic mental health. Questions. So, yeah. It's a free for all, um, I don't care for it. <laughs> yeah, it's a free for all, I think, I, I, wants to answer that. I, I could probably answer a little bit about the forensic because when I was finishing my call, I was on secondment in the post in the forensic service um, when I was um, doing my advanced practice and they, they, they supported me to, to complete it, but there was no role. Now you're only talking about a year, probably a year ago, uh, for advanced practice within the forensic service at that time. That's why I had I had to leave uh, and, and actually um, go for an advanced practice post within a different service because there was no, they hadn't advertised at, at that time and there was no real requirement at that and that's locally it might be different nationally but definitely locally there was no um, advanced nurse practitioner rules at that time in the forensic service whether it's something yeah. that they'll look at in the future it it was something that that i, I had a lot of thought and i, I worked quite hard with somebody because we kind of thought of a role as in a liaison and diversion service but it didn't quite take off and we mm -hmm. thought that would be a, a natural role for an advanced nurse practitioner yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah, so I suppose from my perspective, having been around, so I, I started in advanced practice in the 90s. We were talking about being able to say last century yeah. <laughs> before the conversation started. But yeah, so and it was in primary care and the role was developing then as well. So for me, there's a, an absolute need to have this these roles as service-led requirements rather than practitioner-led so yeah. that's great if people want to develop and develop into these roles that's brilliant but actually you need the buy-in you need to make sure that there is a role there that the support's there to develop it that yeah. everybody knows what you're doing that um yeah there might be opportunities for you to develop in a, a certain way and elaine's demonstrated how that's happened with her role but um, it absolutely needs to be a service-led requirement to mm. make sure that all the governance requirements and everything's yeah. in place, all the perhaps funding to do some of these programmes as well is available because that can be a blocker for people um, as well as, you know, clinical supervision is so important, isn't it? And you really need to have that um, in place as well to enable you to um, move forward. Um, you know, we talk about this triangle of capability within uh, the Transforming Roles programmes work and that clinical supervision is one of the cornerstones of it, along with competence and along with um, appropriate education as well. So it's just so important that you have yeah. all the boxes ticked, everything in place to enable you to progress um, fully supported. Yeah. I think, yeah, I totally agree with you about um, factoring it into workforce development plans because it is about looking at the, the team as well, isn't it, and um, and what's required. And certainly where I work, you know, we're going down that road of looking at post and roles for the future and thinking more creatively about what roles we need to create to, um, you know, to, to meet people's needs, I guess. So... Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. I agree about the governance as well. Do you think from a supervision point of view that needs to be from another advanced practitioner? So somebody would need to have the skill set in order to be able to support you to develop. But mm -hmm. could you actually have one person that's got the skill set across all, all four pillars wound into one yeah. person? You know, it yeah. may be that you need different people to give you yeah. different um support depending on your area of practice and actually just to um, drop into the conversation as well because Elaine mentioned it you know being given time um, for the non-clinical pillars within Scotland it's within the policy that people should have 10% time dedicated to it now that doesn't mean that it's working in all areas at the moment but it's just an interesting and unique yeah. approach to um to advanced practice developments that we don't see in the other um for the other three countries at the moment um yeah. so it'll be interesting to see does having it in policy actually make a difference mm. Mm. Uh, I did, sorry I, I did get my clinical supervision from a, another advanced nurse practitioner not a mental yeah. health one but a, 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 an advanced nurse practitioner 
Yeah. Which, and, and your focus was on clinical, so that is absolutely relevant. You needed to, the knowledge and skills to be able to develop in that area. But if research is an area that you need further support in, would that same person be able to provide that? Perhaps they would, but perhaps it would be somebody else that you would look in, be looking for with more specific um, mm. needs to be able to support you. Yeah, yeah. I think we've got another question coming there, Vanessa. Can you see it? Yeah, I think it quite links to what I was saying earlier about the um, sort of creating mini doctors, doesn't it, as well? So it says, um, void to hear colleagues' passion for advanced nursing practice and mental health. But what are the steps needed now from academia and services to move the roles into the wonderful gamut of A&P practice? And how do we resist the compulsion of the strong driver of medical support augmentation? <laughs> There's uh, quite quite a few um, really interesting points in there. I think if I can maybe just pick up on one with with academia, I I, mm. I think what we need to do um, is, is 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 strengthen um, the um, education that we're providing within academia with regards to, um, and I'm I'm talking about mental health now and building in mental health within advanced practice. So I think we do have a role to play. In, in academia and I think that is how we go about strengthening the role and um, how we go about evaluating our, our programs and um, the methodology we're using for that and um, how we're working together as universities um, and I suppose you know and, and Colette had mentioned regulation will that do something for advanced practice I think that I think there'll be some firm arguments for but there'll be some concerns about that as well yeah yeah and one last thing about what Colette had mentioned about credentialing. Why is it we're only having advanced practitioners coming on the programmes for two years and then exiting so often? You know, yeah. still so so many are exiting after two years and not going on to do the full degree. Yeah. Full I, master's I, degree. Part of the reason for that is the fact that the funding stops. Certain, yeah. Certainly with us, it stopped at postgraduate diploma level. So we've got people exiting. So if you then talk about actually we want research active advanced practitioners, mm. they're not prepared to master's level. So, you know, that we're kind of shooting ourselves in the foot with that. Mm. I think we need to have quite a strong voice, don't we? And I think we all yeah. need to be working together. Things have changed mm. now from how they originally evolved back in the 90s. We need to be moving away, even some of the terminology that we use. So we talk about non-medical prescribing. Why don't we just say prescribing? Yeah, you know, absolutely. We, we need to be really careful with everything that we're putting out there, that it's not, mm -hmm. it's about maximising our potential yeah. rather than, um, you know, creating this hybrid role because there's a lack of medics. We need to be changing the rhetoric a little bit. We can do that. Yeah, I think as well. Way. Yeah, I think as well in terms of research, it's a responsibility. It links back to what you were saying about um, services supporting the role because there's a role, isn't there, for organisations to support research in practice because there's still such a massive gap between academic research and actually translational research in practice, isn't there? Because you can equip a nurse with research skills, but then when they go back to the organisation, if the governance isn't there, to support research and to kind of support meaningful research and mm -hmm. then how to embed that into practice then those skills are not going to be utilized I don't know what you thought Sarah but that yeah absolutely agree with you and and one of the challenges we did a little bit of research looking at um you know what the barriers were to people being involved um yeah. advanced practitioners being involved yeah. and um one of the barriers was the fact that they would go back to practice areas having spent so much time and energy mm -hmm. doing their and completing their master's programme and then nobody was interested and yeah. it wasn't taken on board. So it's not, so as educators, yes, there's lots that we can do to support people, to help them develop, to help give them skills that they'll be able to um, submit abstracts or, you know, write for publication or do these types of things. But it's not just about what we can do with an academic practice. We need to have that support from practice settings as well. But recognising, as Nikki was saying earlier, you know, there's just so much pressure on services just now, isn't there, that yeah, sometimes there just isn't the capacity or, you know, mm. people have kind of lost some of that passion for um, for doing these types of things because they're so focused on providing the clinical um, work that needs to be that needs to be um, delivered. 
Yeah. It, it may be... Nursing research falls down the gap a little bit in the, you know, practice one applied research stuff that they, how do we get this list down? How do we get more people to be happy with our service? And then you've got university settings who really want to meet a certain sort of almost made up gold standard. You know, mm -hmm. they want RCTs, they want gigantic studies. And I don't know that many mental health nurses that are really passionate about that sort of thing. A lot of mental health nurses are drawn towards qualitative work. They're drawn towards co-production. It's slower, it's um, detailed, and it's it just doesn't look like the kind of research that people find persuasive, perhaps is the polite word for it. I mean, I think they're wrong, but <laughs> I do think that maybe that's one of the reasons that nursing research doesn't look like other types of professions research. And I think um, it might be useful just to, to flag up um, some of the work that, that, that Colette's really led here. I've kind of clumsily hung on to her coattails with the that's network that's uh, been developed in Scotland, um, where at the University of Dundee, we've started to kind of develop this increasingly large um, community of practice, um, multi-professional as, as such, of bringing people who are involved in advanced practice from different professions together. Um, we're, we're meeting regularly, we're getting good attendance. And, um, you know, Nikki, you were talking about research, and this is a chance, a forum where we can bring people together um, to talk about work that's being done in other areas, linking people together. Um, because you're right, I think sometimes it's um, doing work on your own can be really, really daunting. Mm. But when you get the chance to meet up with other people who maybe are like minded, maybe have different skill sets that can mm -hmm. lend towards the type of work that you're wanting to do. Um, and this has been this has been a big success um, over the last year. I mean, Elaine's obviously involved in that. Um, but we have clinicians, we have um, pharmacy involved. Um, and, and we're hoping that will continue to grow so that we can uh, just keep advanced practitioners within who have an interest in mental health, a passion for mental health, um, learning, um, sharing, you know, good good materials and um, and communicating with each other. Yeah, and, and there's lots of opportunities to raise the profile as well in terms of, you know, the British Journal of Nursing have a good ACP series advanced clinical practitioner series so there's opportunities for publication within that we, we're talking uh, Paul Elaine and myself and others are talking about um, writing a book for publication around you know feature on advanced practice mental health that will be the focus of it so um, if anybody wants to be involved in that we're really keen to hear from you as well and you know just really keen to support people to start raising the profile more um, because it's there's just so so much that can be done within mental health advanced practice you know I, I think it would make such a difference as it has done within um you know adult services that are not mental health focused so um i think it, there's real opportunities yeah. here for people to lead the way i've got another question here and it's i'm going to praise it because it's a little bit long no criticism thank you very much for everyone who's um coming in with questions well it's basically um from a practice educator talking about the pillars, saying that, that basically they knew there was AMPs and they knew that there was um, uh, pres uh, prescribers, but they didn't know that they had there was any other way of being an advanced practice mental health nurse. Is there something you could talk about, like maybe some of the things that other people are doing? What examples mm -hmm. there are of advanced practice for, for mental health? So, um, I mean, Elaine, you might want to come in here with, um, with your networks. Uh, I'll let you think about it, but yeah, certainly we've um, we've got people um, who are working in substance misuse services, and um, we have people in child and adolescent um, who are working as consultant nurses within that scope of advanced mm -hmm. um, practice. Um, CMHTs, there's a good few based in the CMHTs. The crisis team have um, I found this on the web. Mm -hmm. AMPs and post. There's not, yeah. The CMHTs have took most of the, of, the, of the advanced nurse practitioners in mental health locally. Mm -hmm. Where we're not, people. sorry, I was going to say, where we're not hearing much in the way of advanced practice is in the acute mm -hmm. areas, interestingly enough, which is heavily <laughs> medicalized. Yeah. Um, I could be on by his fingernails, some might say as well. <laughs> I, 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 I could hear something, it. it's screaming. <laughs> I went into 
to um, the acute wards when I first um, got my post as an AMP and I spoke to the senior charge nurse and she reckoned there was a role for AMPs within the, the, the acute mental health services, but there's never ever been any jobs advertised for, I, I'm not sure why, and that's that's another area that we probably need to raise our profile, not just in um, the, the acute wards, but the rehabilitation wards. The, the uh, Psychiatry of Old Age do have um, AMPs uh, working with them. But yeah, I'm not sure why there's none ward based actually locally that I, that I'm aware of, and I'm, I'm not I don't I'm not sure of that why that is because there's definitely a need, especially for um, yeah. new patients coming in. You could be doing all the the, the you're you, using all your skills that you've learned um, as an AMP mm -hmm. um, and fitting a new patient. Uh, uh, yeah, that's something that we probably need to look at. But that, I suppose that brings us back to research as well, doesn't yeah, it? We need to have the research to support these roles. So it's that kind of vicious circle almost as well, isn't it? We need to be raising the profile through um, being able to detail the impact um, of advanced practice. Yeah, and I think what the research is telling us is that there is a lack of clarity um, okay. with regards to the role, the ambiguity of the role. And I think um, that that's something that, that, that you know that, that we need to think about within our leadership um, about how we take this forward. Um, you know, someone mentioned earlier on about you know why do we need an advanced practitioner? What are they going to do? Mm. Um, because we do have, I think, if we if we maybe canvassed all the advanced practitioners uh, in this area, um, you would find that the, the job descriptions are totally different from one to the other. The, the job descriptions are probably the same, Paul, but actually what they're doing in practice is probably, like they've probably written the same, in fact, I know that the job descriptions are all pretty much the same. However, actually in the clinical areas, what we're doing is very, very different from area to area. Mm -hmm. And I think it goes on the needs of the service. What's what's the, the biggest need at that time? So we're all kind of going in our own little uh, niches, I suppose, um, to what, what's needed. Got another couple of questions come in from uh, Lorna and Michael. Vanessa? Yeah, we've got, um, it's just um, in response to the earlier question that we've got about um, specific um, AMP um, surround forensic nursing, for example. And it's just a comment really that says, I worry that this is not even considered in their maternal need for defence of pre-registration mental health field specific education mm. so yeah it's more a comment than a question um mm. and then another one says i i'm not sure what she means by a and a i've asked her to oh asher and aaron so yeah. you'll know this one more than i do i wondered if she meant a and e at first she's put i thought a and a had an amp in admission wards so that's okay. the comment there yeah i should probably say something about the forensic stuff, I focused on looking at the the, the hospital, but in that actually mm -hmm. prison setting, I do believe there is advanced nurse practitioners in the prison setting, not in um, maybe the hospital forensic wards, but the, definitely in the, the prison there, there, there's advanced nurse practitioners and substance misuse. I'm not sure about mental health, but in primary care there are, so. Yeah. We've got, I mean, I work in prisons and we've got amps in it that are mental health qualified. I guess we haven't got them that have done specific um, health injustice, advanced nurse qualifications, which might be kind of more the question, although we're moving towards that with um, discussions with universities because we feel that it is a specific specialism working in prisons. Yes, so, and therein lies the challenge yeah. because <laughs> as yeah. the... As the rules develop, you know, we're recognising more and more, actually, we need this in the programme, actually, we need that in the programme. Yeah. And it's going mm -hmm. to get to the point, how do you continue to yeah. maintain a robust programme when you have to add all this other content? And which needs to be yeah. there? There's no argument about that. But what's going, yeah. to be, yeah. what's going to be the give, you know? I think one of the other fields that we've not spoken about is... Um, learning disabilities and intellectual disabilities. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and how, do we, how do we encourage yeah. that to flourish as well? Mm, yeah, definitely. I, I do think the neurodiverse the AMP role fits nicely with that, uh, and it was that was part a big part of my role um, in my last post was um, uh, trying to get the the waiting list down a little bit for the people that were waiting on these assessments. I think it fits mm. really nicely because mm. you can do the full assessment, you can do the prescribing, the follow up, the health checks, and I, I, I think you could collate actually evidence pretty quickly. 
um, uh, how that's working. So I, I think that's a good um, area for AMPs. Yeah, I do, definitely. Yeah, particularly around screening and assessments and supporting teams to develop more person-centred care plans around neurodiversity yeah. because I think it's such um, a sort of emerging field, isn't it, at the moment? And I know a lot of nurses feel so unconfident around screening people for neurodiversity and then what to do next. So I, I would agree with you. I think it's definitely an emerging field that we'll see come more into prominence in the next few years. Well, I hope so anyway. Yeah, yeah. It, there's, it's, it's got a lot of attention at the moment. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I can see we're heading towards 40 minutes already, so we're going to have to start thinking about winding up soon. But just to say thank you very much to people who've asked questions. If you do have any more questions, please put them in. We'll try and get to them by the time we finish up. Um, and if not, we'll check back and, and see what we can do. We've also been tweeting out links under the hashtag MHTV as well. So if there's anything come up in terms of, oh, I wish I could check into that framework, it will be on. It'll be there if you if you have a look. Um, so I guess we've come round one by one. I guess we'll go in the same order that we started. But Colette, is there anything you particularly wanted us to sort of draw attention to or consider before we finish up? So I suppose really things that I would suggest would be um, please engage with Happy UK, the Association of Advanced Practice Educators UK. I think we've tweeted out a link to them. We have a student handbook on there that I think will maybe of interest to some people. We're really keen to develop student resources. So this is for people prior to undertaking master's programme. So we want to try and give you an idea of what the programme is going to be like and what um, support or, you know, identify your own needs within the sort of broader areas uh, prior to undertaking a programme. So that's that would be one thing. We're always keen to succession plan as well. So that's another reason for, for looking at API UK. Um, the ICN conference in 2024 in uh, Aberdeen, really keen that we raise the profile of advanced practice mental health nursing. So uh, there'll be further detail on the website that's been tweeted out with regards to how you might get involved with that. Lots of opportunities for people, you know, um, maybe reviewing abstracts or, you know, being involved on the day. Really, really keen um, to get everyone involved in that and have a UK um, wide uh, look at advanced practice from that multidisciplinary perspective as well and um, I suppose really to just you know what is advanced practice we spoke about so really just to keep in your head about that level of practice um, is what we're talking about when we talk about advanced practice rather than a specific role so that's all from me thank you Nikki. Cool anything for me? Yeah, and maybe just um, a couple of questions, um, Nikki, just to leave um, yep. the viewers with. And, and something that I'm still pondering is, um, you know, there seems to be a real appetite for advanced practice within mental health nursing, and and I um, and I certainly think um, that they can make significant differences. But um, so, firstly, I guess um, where are advanced practitioners um, for mental health nurses best placed to work in? Um, and and what what are what what do we think are the most effective advanced practitioner mental health interventions? Mm, interesting. And where do you want people to send these answers? <laughs> Just send them to collect. <laughs> well, if that's the case, can I ask another question then? <laughs> If that's mm. the case, can I throw something else in there as well? Really keen yeah. to think we've, we, you know, we've talked about master's level education, um, but at the moment we have people coming out at the point of registration with master's qualifications. Yeah. So it's really just around that. Would people consider maybe instead of undertaking a master's programme, would it be yeah. something that you would consider going for doctoral education if we had an advanced practice programme to offer, for example? Mm -hmm. So um, just to throw that out there. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. I'll tweet these out after the end of the programme. So if people want to reply on the hashtag, we'll keep an eye on that there. Thank you. Absolutely. Elaine? I think for me, as I've said, it's a very privileged position to be in and, and, and one that I absolutely love. And I think it's time now for probably a lot of us to get together, definitely the ones that, that, that finished their training al alongside me, and actually to look at the impact that it has had on 
even though our roles are pretty different all over, I think it's time that we came together, looked to the mm -hmm. evidence and the impact it's had, whether it's qualitative or quantitative. I think we need to collate that evidence and, and, and then put it forward uh, again to get more people uh, training and in roles. Because like Colette said at the very beginning, we need to raise the, the profile significantly in mental health moving forward. Yeah. Yeah. About you, Vanessa, was there anything that you wanted to add to that? Yeah, no, I think for me, just reflecting on what we're saying about the um, the support needed from organisations once people have qualified, I think really interesting comment about the 10% supervision commitment is is great, isn't it? And I'm, yeah. and I'm sure that must impact just around the sort of um, organisational commitment to that as well. And and, and you know, organisations having to monitor that as a standard. So I think that's really interesting. And I guess what we're saying about the research to practice issue as well and the, the difficulties around that and that sitting within practice as much as it sits within academia to make sure that happens. So, yeah, really interesting conversation. I think I've got a lot more questions and I have answers from it all now. Yeah. I think, it, it, I think as Phil said, it, it's shown a lot about why is it that nurses can't or mental health nurses struggle to see themselves as advanced practitioners when I know so many incredibly skilled, thoughtful, um, intelligent yeah. practitioners who yeah. everybody else recognises as skilled and maybe they don't see yeah. it in themselves, which I think is a really strange thing. And maybe it's to do with mm. our, our lack of clarity over over, um, mm. over mental health roles sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. That could be an issue. Confidence. And the other thing is kind of like the, the, the politics around it you know, when we are so underfunded on basic levels, mm -hmm. that it, I find it really frustrating that there's so much talent who aren't able maybe to go on these courses or get support to bring in the kind of changes that they can imagine and see. I find that quite a challenge as well. And this idea about, you know, mini doctoring, I find that that there's a couple yeah. of questions came in around, you know, is this us doing more work for less money again? And I absolutely understand where that comes from because it's rooted in the fact that nurses can't pay their, their mortgages that's yeah. infuriating yeah. but I also kind of am inspired by the fact that there's so many people who who still are in love with mental health you know and this idea that maybe we could help things to be better so it's a it's a complicated thing isn't it I'm, I'm all wild up now so now I'm not gonna sleep thank you <laughs> <laughs> so there's lots to think about there but thank you guys so much for your time and for your um for your passion on this subject and for the people who joined in with questions of all kinds as well it's really really valued um, and we have to have these discussions about this kind of work. Otherwise, we never get to a stage where we move forward. Um, next week, we're talking about uh, digital mental health and CYP, so children and young people. That's right, Vanessa, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah. 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 So we'll be looking forward to seeing you uh, back next week to talk about those things. And if you do feel that you want to contribute more to this discussion, please do use in the hashtag. Um, lovely to speak to everybody. Um, very good Thank to you. have your company tonight. Good night. Thank all. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. 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 B